Hi, my name's Leo and I'm a boat builder and a sailor and I'm on a mission to rebuild and restore this 111 year old classic sailing yacht Tally Ho. Now this week's video is all about corking which is basically the process of making the seams between the planks watertight by packing them with a flexible material, in this case cotton. Now the first thing to address is the actual word itself. Uh, if you're American, there are two ways to say and pronounce it. Um, it started off as corking with an L, um, and then in some places on the West Coast, it, uh, I think, uh, evolved into corking with no L, just C-O-R-K. So in the States, you'll hear different people pronouncing it different ways, but in the UK, and I think most of the rest of the English-speaking world, it's uh, usually spelt with an L, um, but pronounced however the hell you want to pronounce it. The way I speak, uh, it sounds like corking, uh, however it's spelt, so it doesn't make much difference to me. So just a little bit of a background uh, about corking. It's a very, very old technology. Basically, as long as humans have been building boats, they've been uh, sticking something in between the seams or the planks on those boats to try and keep the water out. Um, and there's sort of historical records of anything from uh, moss to animal fat, uh, anything else in between being used to try and seal those gaps between planks. As well as the materials, the methods of corking have obviously developed over a long time as well. Um, but today, the methods, the tools, and the materials that we use have pretty much been in continuous use for several hundred years at least. Now, although corking is obviously a part of boat building, it's often considered to be a trade in its own right. And um, although a lot of people today do a bit of both, a lot of boat builders can also cork. Um, historically, it would often be the case that uh, corkers would only cork. That would be their trade and their full-time job. Right now I'm in Port Townsend, which is unusual uh, in that not only does it have a big wooden boat community, but it's actually got a really unusually large amount of people who are very good at corking. That may be in part because they have a sort of big wooden fishing boat fleet which is maintained here, uh, but whatever the reason, um, there's a surprising amount of people here who are very good, very fast at corking. And I think there might even still be a few people here who are just corkers, and that's all they do. Now the reason I'm actually here today is to meet up with Brad from the Shipwrights Co-op. Uh, he's a shipwright and an excellent corker, um, and he's got an exciting plan about how to help us with Tally Ho's corking. I'm Brad Siemens. I work for the Port Townsend Shipwrights Co-op. Um, a couple years ago, I contacted Leo saying, hey, I'm a corker in Port Townsend and I'd love to help you out with your project. So I told him I'd organize a crew of corkers and I got Paul Stoffer from uh, the Shipwrights Co-op and Jordan Bard, who's an independent shipwright here in the boatyard, to come with me up to Cork Tally Ho. So I'm looking forward to it. So when we uh, cork a boat or cock a boat, as there's a huge debate as to how you pronounce it, um, we use two types of materials, cotton or oakum. And cotton is uh, less fibrous and it compresses into a finer strand at the back of the seam. So we always start with that. It comes in a big paper tube, usually just kind of flaked out and coiled. And I like to roll mine into a ball. It kind of keeps the fibers a little more compressed. After the cotton, if this planks are usually 
oh, inch and a half or greater, um, we'll often put oakum over top of that. And that's um, a hemp material. And typically I'll take this continuous strand and I'll split it into two. And then um, once it's split, it'll get spun or rolled um, into a very uniform, almost dreadlock type material. And that's typically used, uh, again, to, to fill out the outer part of the seam. Um, sometimes we'll put two lines of cotton and a line of oakum. Sometimes we'll put a line of cotton and two lines of oakum. Um, on really big power scows that have really huge timbers, we'll put four or five lines of oakum. Um, we're hoping that Tally Ho, uh, being inch and, inch and three eighths or so depth, uh, will hopefully get away with putting just one line of cotton in there. It goes a lot faster, um, and I think it'll probably do what we need it to do. Sounded like someone was like in a lot of pain with my hair. Yeah, she <laughs> made some very distracting noises. Uh -huh. Okay, we're good. Sure. Hey, Paul. So the corking party went amazingly well. Uh, I'm so impressed by how fast those guys can cork uh, and by how much work they got done through one Saturday, uh, despite being interrupted by pizza and beers. <laughs> um, they pretty much corked up uh, over a third of the hull. So I'm really, really grateful to Brad and Paul from the Shipwrights Co-op and to Jordan as well. And I think it's amazing uh, that they wanted to get involved and support this project and help us out like they did. So thanks to those guys. Um, the rest of the boat is down to me and Pete to, uh, to finish off the corking. Pete's an excellent corker, as you've already seen. Um, I haven't done nearly as much corking as any of those guys. Uh, it just wasn't something that I was involved in very much in the yards where I worked. So I'm gonna have to work hard to try and get up to speed. Um, but I'm looking forward to getting the practice and I'm looking forward to getting the hull fully corked up.
Uh, so before, before we put any cotton in, we oil our seams. Uh, we use linseed oil. It kind of assists you in, in getting that cotton rolled into the seam. It kind of sl like slick, slickens everything up. Um, but in addition to that, when linseed oil cures, it gets tacky. Um, and that'll help while the boat's still sitting um, for however long it's sitting before we put it in the water. Uh, that it'll help keep the cotton kind of stuck in there, kind of like glue. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of prevent it from, from moving around too much if the, if the planks continue to shrink a little bit. So our process out here, at least what I've learned in Port Townsend and what most of the guys use, uh, we kind of do it in three stages to, to put the material into the seam. Uh, we'll thread it first, and that's when you use a very thin iron, uh, what we call a threading iron, to tuck in uh, the cotton um, into a lot of loops. Uh, and you know, sometimes you're doing 10 feet at a time, multiple seams, whatever, you, whatever your process is, but you tuck them um, and then you use that same iron or I use that same iron to roll my cotton. And that's a process of uh, kind of pivoting it in the seam up and down, above and below on the, on the edges of the cotton. So above and below the cotton and that pushes that cotton back a little further into the seam. Um, it also helps twist it up uh, into kind of a rope. Um, and so after we thread and then roll, we, we do what I call making, uh, making it down or just making. You choose your making iron depending on how wide the seam is. So all of our making irons have our different gauges uh, from pretty thin to pretty thick. That's when you're really driving the material home. Um, so it's partially set in the seam and you go back over everything you've just put in. Um, and that's when you're really giving it a good hit. Uh, it's important to drive it um, all the way back, not all the way through, <laughs> but all the way to the back of the seam. Um, and with a really, with new planking, that's really not an issue. Um, you know, the planks are tight together. You're not going to drive it through. Uh, you do need to soften your blows on lighter wood. So those are making irons. That's kind of the process of driving the material in. Uh, we have a lot of other irons we use though <coughs> for, well, this is a, this is a bent iron. Um, and that's for getting into hard to get, you know, kind of hard to get places. So these, I call these nib irons. Some people call them straight irons. Some people call them spike irons. Um, but anyway, they're essentially just really narrow irons and they help you get into nibs. Then we have uh, reefing hooks. When you're, uh, when you're go to recork a boat or recalk a boat, um, this is to pull the old material out. These are another type of reefing iron. A little bit awkward, Pete. A little off. Oh, is, is this? Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Yeah, it's awkward. I got my handy dandy bent iron. Oh yeah. I usually use against like uh, the sills of houses on the, the cabins on the deck. Helps to get into corners, but it also offsets it, so 
the angle of my hammer is a little better here. Mm -hmm. Now I know a lot of people will have had questions about corking mallets um, and why they are this shape and so on. So I'm going to do my best to explain. So the head is always made of a very hard, heavy timber. Um, black locust, uh, mesquite, live oak, uh, ebony, lignum vitae even. Um, this is mesquite um, and that obviously just gives it weight and it's also very durable. Um, they actually start out a little longer than this often, um, but as they're worn down over time, these rings, which stop the head from mushrooming out, they're driven back down the mallet, and so the older a mallet is and the more it's been used, the shorter it gets. A lot of mallets have quite a thick handle, like this one, and uh, although that feels a little odd at first, it actually uh, is easier on your hand in the long run. You're less inclined to grip it really tightly like you would uh, if it had a very thin handle on it. Now the shape of the head is the most obvious thing. Why is it so long and thin? Um, and there's a few reasons. One reason is that it actually uh, gives you better reach allows you to hit things a little bit further away without extending your arm because if you can imagine you're doing this all day the difference between doing it sort of out here with a small mallet and being able to do it here with your elbow by your side makes a huge difference and makes it a lot easier um, so you get more reach it also allows you to get into awkward spots in the boat without hitting your your hand or the handle on the boat itself so again more reach there Another reason for this shape, uh, for having a very small face on the mallet head, um, is because if you had a wide face, it's much easier to uh, hit off of the center of the face, and then you get just a little bit of twist, and that can actually really mess up your rhythm, um, and it also makes it more likely that you're gonna hit your hand on the next hit. So um, having a small face actually makes it more predictable, more consistent, and then having the mass of the head in a long line like this um, actually makes it more resistant to that twisting motion as well. Well, um, kind of like a, uh, a tightrope walker with a long pole. All of the weight of this mallet head, which is relatively heavy, uh, is all directly behind the striking face. Um, and so basically all this combined means that you can actually, without too much effort, you can get a really quite a heavy hit on this uh, with just a few inches of swing. And if you do need to take a much bigger swing, you can get a really, really powerful uh, strike with this corking mallet. The slots are also very interesting, and again, I've heard various different things about these. Um, as far as I can tell, there's a few reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the slots actually make the wood a little bit springy um, so that it bounces better. As you hit the iron, um, the sides of the timber just spring out a tiny bit, and that bounces the mallet back a little bit, which again helps you uh, use a little bit less effort, and it also absorbs a little bit of the shock, a little bit of the reverberation, makes it a little bit easier on your hand. Now cutting these slots in the mallet head is called tuning in the mallet, um, and it does change the pitch of the sound that the mallet makes when it hits the iron. Now some people say that that was actually done to make it sound more musical when there was a big team of corkers working on a boat and if they were doing it all day every day um, that is a possibility but I think the more likely reason for that um, is that it actually helps you hear when the uh, the corking is set properly in the back of the seam um, the sound that the mallet makes hitting the iron changes and if it's a higher pitch sound that change is more easy to hear so it actually helps you cork because it lets you know when you've um, worked on an area long enough and you can move on it is really cool to hear uh, a lot of corkers working together, hear the notes of all the different mallets. Um, and interestingly, as a boat gets more and more corked up, the whole overall sound of that boat changes. Um, it gets tighter and tighter and sort of all the individual planks turn into one uh, sort of coherent structure. Uh, and the sound that it makes as it's being hit raises in pitch uh, till it's almost like a drum. So we can see then that this sort of odd but simple tool uh, has actually been developed over a very long time for a very specific purpose and it's perfect for its job. Um, so it's not just sort of arcane traditionalism which leads corkers to use these, they really really are incredibly practical and if you uh, try corking with a normal mallet after you're used to one of these, uh, it's just incredibly difficult compared to this.
so after a lot of pounding cotton, we have finished corking the hull, uh, which feels really great. Um, it was a lot of work, of course, but it actually went a lot quicker than I had anticipated, and it was a lot of fun. I certainly really enjoyed uh, getting more practice and getting better and faster at corking. And corking actually can be quite meditative when you get into it. A lot of the guys I know that are good at corking uh, actually really enjoy doing it. So the next thing is to paint the seams, and we do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is just to kind of hold the cotton in place. Uh, we use quite thick paint, and it just helps to sort of make sure the cotton doesn't decompress uh, or move at all. Uh, and the other reason is to prime the seams, to prime the bare wood uh, and the cotton uh, to take the seam compound, which is a kind of putty that we'll put in the seams uh, to bring them out to the, be flush with the surface of the outside of the boat. So the hull is fully corked, the seams are painted, um, this boat could theoretically almost float. Uh, it doesn't have a ballast keel yet, uh, it's not back on, and of course there's still a hole uh, where the prop shaft's going to go, but um, if we bung that up, uh, she could theoretically float, for a little while at least. Um, we're not going to test that though, there's still a lot more work to do, um, but it does feel very good to reach this milestone. So. Thanks a lot for watching, and a massive, massive thank you to everyone who has donated or otherwise supported this project. It does make a huge difference. It means we're able to continue the work, and it means I'm able to make and edit these videos. So I really, really appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>